Den amerikanske journalisten Ronan Farrow ødela julebursesongen for en del da han avslørte Harvey Weinstein, filmchef og satte i gang MeToo-bevegelsen. Men han reddet julebordsesongen og arbeidslivet for enda flere. Og da han var ferdig med det, da gikk han i gang med å redde diplomatiet med bestselleren boka War on Peace. Med oss i dag, jeg må ta det på engelsk og skjønne, sånn at han skjønner at han skal komme ut. Here to talk about diplomacy in reverse. In reverse? Faen, jeg er dårlig på engelsk. We're honored to welcome Mr. Ronan Farrow. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the NHO, uh, to your Royal Highness. Uh, thank you to all of the distinguished guests here today. That's a tough act to follow. I'll try not to let you guys down. And let me tell you, as a starting point, it is very nice to be in a country where the leader doesn't tweet in the middle of the night. <laughs> Here's the last tweet from Erna Solberg about official foreign ministry business. Excited to visit India, Danya Vad Narendra Modi for the wonderful welcome. Lots to discuss. Ocean economy, trade, climate action, how to bring forward the SDGs. India is key to success. Here is my president, Donald Trump's last tweet about official State Department business. Mike Pompeo is doing a great job. Rex Tillerson, his predecessor, didn't have the mental capacity he needed. He was dumb as a rock. I couldn't get rid of him fast enough. He was lazy as hell. Now it's a whole new ball game. Great spirit at State. It is no longer a novelty to suggest that Donald Trump's tweets require a little fact-checking. So let me tell you, the spirit of American diplomacy is not in great shape right now. And that's been one of the great tragedies of our time. That has affected all of us all around the world. But it's also created a moment where we all need to rise to the occasion. It has underscored the challenges and the opportunities. There are two types of military dispute the one settled by negotiation and the other by force. Since the first is characteristic of human beings and the second of beasts, we must have recourse to the second only if we cannot exploit the first. That's not from me, that's from Cicero's On Duty. Just that last part, not the Rex Tillerson is dumb as a rock part. <laughs> as far as I can tell, just about every culture in modern history has come to this conclusion about diplomacy at one point or another. My book opens each chapter with a similar quote from a wildly different cultural context. There's even one from the American rapper Tupac. The subject of the foreign minister's remarks hit a really personal note for me. Not in Norwegian, I had to listen with the translation. Before I wrote about diplomacy, I was a diplomat. For a number of years, I worked at our State Department in the United States and in Afghanistan and Pakistan as uh, first an apprentice to one of the diplomats who informed American diplomacy in the modern era most, a larger-than-life figure named Richard Holbrook. He was a profoundly difficult man with legendary eruptions of temper. But he was also a, a great one with a dazzling intellect and an extraordinary curiosity about the world around him. Most of all, he believed in the sentiments that you just heard about that an interconnected world is a stronger one, that isolationism and protectionism are traps that we fall into in moments of crisis at our own peril, that they are short-sighted, and that cooperation can save lives. And he proved it. Over a three-month period in 1995, Richard Holbrook alternately cajoled and harangued the parties to the Bosnia conflict to get one of the great modern peace accords of our times. For one month, he basically imprisoned the negotiators at Dayton Air Force Base in Ohio, uh, a stage where he could fully exert his flair for diplomatic theater. He, he, in one case, seated Slobodan Milosevic underneath a B-2 bomber during dinner to upset him and unnerve him. He announced in the middle of talks that the Americans were done and actually had fake luggage delivered outside of the negotiators' doors to make the parties to this agreement panic and come to the table. 
The Dayton Peace Accord that resulted was imperfect. It ceded almost half of Bosnia to Milosevic and Serbian aggressors. It basically rewarded atrocities in some way. It's completely legitimate to criticize it. That said, I raise it because it is an example of a great, complicated peace accord in modern times. It is an example of saving lives through peacemaking, because it ended years of bloodshed. A few years later, Milosevic continued his aggressions in Kosovo and finally provoked NATO strikes and his removal from power to face trial at The Hague. The night before the strikes, he had a final conversation with Holbrook, who told him, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Now, getting harangued with a tired Schwarzenegger catchphrase wasn't the worst indignity Slobodan Milosevic faced that week, but it underscores that Richard Holbrook, like many great diplomats, was no dove. He believed in diplomacy deeply, though. He once called it a combination of chess and mountain climbing, and he viewed it as one of the most important ways in which our nations can reshape the world. That tradition is part of the creation myths of my country. Without Benjamin Franklin's negotiations with the French, there would have been no treaty of alliance and no naval support to secure American independence. Without Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay brokering the Treaty of Paris, there would have been no formal end to the war with the British. And after World War II, it was diplomatic endeavor that reshaped the international order, including creating many of the structures that we know and rely upon today. Those years saw the forging of a great wartime alliance between the United States and the UK, brokered by Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. The same era brought about the creation of the World Bank and the IMF, negotiated between the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and Japan. It produced the containment doctrine that came to define much of the Cold War for decades to come. This was, in large part, the work of diplomats, including members of the then brand new Professional Association of American Diplomats, the Foreign Service. And in the post-war years, some of those same diplomats helped to pave the way for other important accomplishments that we still feel the echoes of, including the Marshall Plan, which brought the US and Norway closer together, and of course, the creation of NATO. Diplomacy is not a panacea, it's not a fix-all. Even that golden era that I described of so much diplomatic endeavor and accomplishment was imperfect and often had pretty disastrous repercussions. Containment was appropriated as a rationale for Cold War escalation on the military front decades later. Uh, many of the diplomats that were part of that era then became proponents of US engagement in Vietnam and helped to mire my country in that conflict. But those same figures, it has to be said, did have undeniable success and staying power in stabilizing the world. Now, that history is in pretty stark contrast to what we're looking at today in terms of America's commitment to diplomacy. In the first year of the Trump administration alone, more than 1,300 diplomats were unceremoniously fired. New hiring was also frozen initially. At first, it was announced that there would be no more new classes in which foreign service officers were trained, the so-called A100 class, the introductory course, which is basically like a Hogwarts, Harry Potter situation in the Virginia countryside where we train our diplomats. Now, there was outrage immediately at that, and they did reinstate new classes, but many of the fellowships and apprenticeships that draw the most talented professionals to the, the profession of American diplomacy remain frozen. And the effect has been tangible. In that first year of the Trump administration, the number of new recruits taking the Foreign Service entrance exam plummeted by 26%. That is the lowest level of interest in diplomacy that my country has seen in more than a decade. Under the best of circumstances, public service is a tough sell. The State Department has always faced challenges in recruiting the best and brightest minds when the, the private sector can offer much better incentives at times. Imagine today when the handwriting is on the wall that Trump doesn't value the State Department. That's what one former Secretary of State, John Kerry, told me for this book. Imagine what that does to the best people. There seems to be just as little interest in the current administration in filling the senior roles that have been left intact at the State Department. Hundreds of positions are still empty across American diplomacy. The building is being run mostly by deputies elevated to acting assistant secretary status, many of whom have decades less experience than their unceremoniously removed predecessors. And without those experts, the rest of the world, including Norway, has been left at the mercy 
of whims and tantrums. Again and again, the current American president's off-the-cuff remarks have threatened delicate areas of foreign policy. We have plenty of options for Venezuela, and by the way, I'm not going to rule out a military option, he said this past year as political turmoil roiled that country. No one knew what it meant. No one had talked about military engagement in Venezuela. It sparked a big diplomatic fight. Venezuela's defense minister called it an act of madness. Now, now here's the thing. That kind of hardball diplomatic approach might have a place in an aggressive strategy shaped by experts who know the conflict. But officials in the State Department's Latin America Bureau said that that wasn't what was happening there. In fact, none of them had heard that he was going to say that, and none of them knew what it meant. A similar pattern has played out in the relationships you all know so well here in Europe. Trump advisors worked overtime to ensure that President Trump would include a commitment to collective defense when addressing NATO leaders for the first time when he visited Europe in his first year in office. It was a pledge that has been considered non-negotiable for just about every president since Truman. It's never been controversial. After months of aides careful planning to insert this concept into his prepared remarks, Trump ad-libbed and omitted the line. It took weeks of panic to get through that crisis. There was no walking back the idea that the American president just cared about NATO less. And at a working level, Colleagues in our two governments had to get together and assure everyone that this didn't actually mean the policy was changing. And of course, you all remember the incident last year when your good prime minister visited my country for the first time and Donald Trump took the occasion to launch into a diatribe about the special counsel Robert Mueller, who is investigating his administration and his associates for election interference. She sat and looked uncomfortable and was very polite. Thank you for that, Norway. Uh, you may recall also that the next day he did say that he liked Norway a lot in a colorful way uh, and welcomed immigrants from Norway. And, uh, you know, uh, you'll have to excuse the language. It is what the president said, said that uh, you guys are not like those other shithole countries. <laughs> and it's true, it is lovely here. <laughs> the consequence of America's void of diplomatic expertise is acute. Around the world, what we are seeing is uniformed military officers increasingly handling the negotiation, the economic reconstruction, the infrastructure development, for which we once had a devoted body of specialists. As a result, a very different set of relationships is coming to the fore in America's posture in the world, where civilians aren't empowered to negotiate, military-to-military -military alliances are flourishing. America has changed who it brings to the table in too many cases, and by extension, it is changing and empowering different players at the other side of that table. Foreign ministries are still there in relationships like our one with Norway at a working level, but foreign militias and foreign militaries occupy more and more space in America's international dealings. It's part and parcel with a moment that we have all come to know right now. Nationalism and protectionism, are on the rise in nation after nation. We are shooting first and asking questions later or never in too many conflicts where questions need to be asked. We are closing our borders. We are cutting off trade. I know this is an issue that you are all talking about incessantly here. It is one for us, too, back home. We are building walls at a time when we need to be joining arms to address shared challenges. Now, we leave that trend in place at all of our peril. My generation, the generation of many of us in this room, inherits a set of challenges that includes pandemic disease, a changing climate, depleting fossil fuels like oil, a world threatened by the spread of dangerous weapons of mass destruction, and societies in every corner of our planet riven by entrenched enmities and conflict. And then there are new challenges, like cyber war and election interference. The bottom line is previous moments in history when we forsook diplomacy in favor of isolationism failed to solve these problems. In many cases, it made them worse. If we are going to have a chance at overcoming those obstacles, we are going to need stronger alliances than ever. We are going to need more conversation than ever. For more on peace, I interviewed every living Secretary of State. Henry Kissinger, a complicated figure, a man with blood on his hands in the estimation of many, said something that I did think had great insight. Tactics, he felt, had triumphed over strategy for too many countries. 
When talking about the United States, he said, we are eternally preoccupied with solving whatever problems emerge at the moment. We have an inadequate number of experienced people in the conduct of foreign policy, but even more importantly, an inadequate number of people who can think of foreign policy as a historical process. But the truth is, that is not just America's problem. It is a shared problem for so many of our countries. We turn inward during times of challenge and mistrust. And the solution isn't just on the policy side, it's in our people. I was reminded of something Richard Holbrook, that old boss of mine, wrote in his book, To End a War, his grand history of the Dayton Peace Accord, and of course, because he had a massive ego of himself. Today, public service has lost much of the aura that it had when John F. Kennedy asked us what we could do for our country, he wrote. To hear that phrase before it became a cliche was electrifying. Public service can make a difference. If this book helps inspire a few young Americans to enter the government or other forms of public service, it will have achieved its goals. In the generation of diplomats that I worked with at the State Department, I really did see that commitment to public service that he was writing about. I came to believe that it is still alive and well in the United States of America. And in the young Norwegians I speak to, whenever I come to this country, I see that same commitment to public service. If we have a new generation committed to building bridges instead of walls, I really do believe we all stand a chance. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>